Hello everyone, welcome back to cryptography. So in this video, I'm going to be talking to you all about asymmetric encryption. So asymmetric encryption solves a uh, slightly different problem than symmetric encryption does. So with symmetric encryption, we have this capability in which Alice and Bob both hold the key, the symmetric key, which can be used to either encrypt or decrypt some data. In the case of asymmetric encryption, we have what's known as the public key and the private key. There's this asymmetry between these two keys. You have two separate keys, one that can encrypt and one that can decrypt. So and in doing so, I can pass out my public key to some large number of people and they can all encrypt data. Now, having encrypted that data and sending it, sending it out, no one is able to decrypt that data except the person holding the private key. So there's kind of this asymmetry that arises through uh, this capability of asymmetric encryption as opposed to symmetric encryption where everyone with the key can both encrypt and decrypt with asymmetric encryption. All of the public can encrypt and only that uh, person with the private key is actually able to decrypt the data. And we're going to see what that looks like. Before we do that, though, we need to jump back into the world of math, as we are well aware of by now. Uh, cryptography heavily relies on a lot of mathematical principles for uh, producing its results. And we're going to be uh, looking at much the same thing for asymmetric encryption. So if we think back to the key exchange problem in the case of Diffie-Hellman key exchange, we remember that we were looking at this concept of 7 to the n mod 13. We had this primitive root and this prime number, and we had this capability of kind of uh, garbling up all of these numbers within this group, where we've kind of got this chaotic pattern to this sequence of numbers that repeats in a cycle. We're able to do math on it, and we're not able to kind of go backwards. We're not able to recover n given some result of this due to the difficulty of the discrete logarithm problem. Now there's some interesting other facts about these groups where we have this uh, cyclic pattern where we're working in this uh, group structure and we're going to look at some of them. So the first one that's kind of interesting is what's known as Fermat's Little Theorem. And what Fermat's Little Theorem states is that a to the p is congruent with a mod p where p is prime. So what does that mean? That means that if we're working with, let's say, 13 as our prime number p, right, with this clock, right, we've got this 13, 7 to the n, mod 13, etc. And if we take some number, some random integer, and we raise it to the p, so 7 to the 13, mod 13, turns out that is equivalent to 7. It's equivalent to that initial integer. So we can kind of, in some sense, you know, remove the exponent, right? We can take some number to uh, a prime number, and that is equal to that original number in the modulus of p, right? a to the p is congruent with a mod p when p is a prime number. And this makes sense, right? If we look at this clock, we've kind of, we're working with these 12 values within this uh, mod 13 group. And if we look at the one o'clock position, right? Or the 13 o'clock position in some sense, right? Uh, we see that that's seven, right? Seven to the one is seven, or seven to the one mod 13 is seven, and seven to the 13 mod 13 is seven, right? We recover that original base number. A to the P is congruent with A mod P. This is what's known as Fermat's Little Theorem. And we can kind of very easily see this in the case of 13, looking at this, you know, garbled clock thing. Okay. So a little bit of math from Fermat's little theorem. We can now also say that a to the p minus one is congruent with one mod p. So where p is a prime and a does not divide p. Uh, okay, so what does that mean? So that means that if we do seven to the 12 mod 13, that is equal to one, right? So the 12 being 12 o'clock in this clock, we can see that that's one. And that's always true for all prime numbers. All of this is true for all prime numbers. Uh, so these are some interesting, cool properties, right? We can kind of recover our initial integer and we can get to one by raising to the P and raising to the P minus one, all within these mod P groups. Okay. Well, we also have another theorem. 
And what this other theorem is called is Euler's theorem. So Euler's theorem says that a to the p minus 1 to the q minus 1 is congruent with 1 mod pq. So that sounds like a somewhat contrived, crazy uh, mathematical statement. Why does anyone care about this? Why did Euler care about it? Maybe you've even heard Euler's name before. It turns out he's a pretty famous mathematician. Why did Euler care about this? And why did this famous mathematician have this theorem named after him? Literally, Euler's theorem, this important mathematician, this is the theorem. Euler's theorem, a to the p minus 1 to the q minus 1 is congruent with 1 mod pq. It seems very arbitrary, but it is in fact true. Um, so the, the requirement being that p is prime and q is prime. Uh, we always get to 1 doing this operation. Okay, so if we do a little bit of math from this, we can also say that a to the p minus 1 times q minus 1 plus 1 is congruent with a mod pq, right? We kind of just multiplied both sides by a, which within exponentiation rules, we can have like, we can move that into becoming a plus 1 by multiplying both sides by a. Uh, and we have now that a to the p minus 1 times q to the, uh, a to the p minus 1 times q minus 1, uh, all plus 1 is congruent with a, right? This is a mathematical truth. Okay. Now, we can say one more thing from this that we're going to point out, which is that a to the r is congruent with a mod pq, where r is congruent with 1 mod p minus 1 q minus 1. So if we work within this modulus of kind of we're working within this mod pq, but within the exponent we're working within this mod p minus 1 q minus 1, we have this truth. So if we ever have a value that is 1 mod p minus 1 q minus 1, and we take some number and raise it, raise it to that r, that we're calling that value r, that is congruent with a mod pq. Hopefully it's kind of clear how all of these statements follow from one another, but this is um, a mathematical truth. This can be proven. Okay, now we can do some very interesting things using this property, and we're going to achieve asymmetric encryption just using these mathematical truths. Okay, so RSA, uh, named after the cryptographers that created it, um, exactly exploits this property. So what we have here is we have this m to the e. So m is our message. We have some message. We rise it to the e, and then we rise that to the d, and that becomes m, all within this mod n. So n is p times q, so our two prime numbers multiplied together. So p is prime, q is prime. And e times d is congruent with 1 within this mod p minus 1, q minus 1, right? We use the previous... Uh, results from Euler's theorem, and we have this statement that is true. We can take m to the e to the d and say that that is uh, congruent with m. And in doing so, we can start performing encryption, as we will see. Uh, so if we want to in perform encryption using an asymmetric encryption algorithm, which in this case we're looking at RSA, uh, we just need to release E and N as public keys. So E and N are our public key. They can be released to the world. We keep D and N private to ourselves. And M is the plain text, and M to the E is the ciphertext. So if someone wants to encrypt something for us, they can take their message, raise it to the E, uh, the public key uh, exponent. And if we want to then go on to decrypt it, we just rise that m to the e now to the d, and we arrive back at m. And we have d as a private value for ourselves. Um, we uh, can now decrypt this, and other people can publicly encrypt it for us. Okay. Now, how does this work? So we previously talked about Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and it relied on this property in which the discrete logarithm is a computationally difficult problem. It is difficult to perform a discrete logarithm. If we have 7 to the n mod 13, it's difficult to recover some n from some result of that equation. Uh, it's difficult to undo exponentiation. The discrete logarithm problem is hard. Well, it turns out another problem that's difficult in math is what's called the prime factorization problem. So it's very easy to multiply, let's say, 7 times 13, and say, hey, 7 times 13, that's 91. We can, we can perform that math very easily. It's actually very difficult to go the other way. 
to say, okay, here's 187. What are its prime factors? Give me all of its prime factors multiplied out to produce 187. And in the case of 187, right, we're working with a small number, so we can actually compute that feasibly. We can say it's 11 times 17. But what if you're working with large numbers? Again, it's easy to multiply two large numbers together to receive an even larger number. Uh, but it is very difficult to factor a large number into its constituent prime numbers. Turns out that, I mean, you can only do marginally better. There have actually been some capabilities that slightly improve things. But you're effectively just going to have to brute force those numbers um, in order to arrive at those prime factors. There's, there's some cool mathematical tricks to do it better, but on the order of, it's basically on the order of uh, brute forcing that to find those numbers. And this is what makes RSA work. Okay, so if we want to perform RSA key generation to get ready to, to produce these values, uh, we need to start by finding two large prime numbers, P and Q. Now, it turns out it's not a hard problem to find large prime numbers. They can be efficiently found using primality tests. Um, so it's not computationally too difficult. I mean, it takes some amount of time, but it's not too difficult, certainly relative to uh, factoring prime numbers, uh, to just find a couple of large prime numbers. Then we compute n as equal to p times q, multiply those two prime numbers together to get n, which is our modulus. And then we compute what's called phi of n, where phi of n is our, our old friend p minus 1 times q minus 1. We compute phi of n. It's got a, a fancy name to it called phi of n. Okay, then we find some e. We choose some e such that the greatest common denominator of e and phi to the n is 1. Or in other words, we need some value where that value e and phi of n are co-prime. That's kind of the definition of the greatest common denominator of two values uh, being one means that those two numbers are co-prime. Now it's very common, and in fact almost always the case, that we just use the value of e being equal to uh, hex 10001, so 65,537. We just almost always exclusively use this value in standard implementations of RSA. That just is what E will be. And in fact, we're so like, we need this to be E. Then in fact, if phi of n, the, the greatest common denominator of E and phi of n are not one, for some reason phi of n turns out to actually be um, a multiple of this 65,537, that we're just going to straight away throw away P and Q and start again. Because we want E to be this. And the reason we want e to be this has to do with exponentiation um, in a modulus being very efficient. Um, so we can do efficient modular exponentiation, and we can do it even more efficiently when only a couple of bits are set. So this is what's known as a Fermat prime, which basically means that it is some 2 to the n plus 1. So some power of 2 plus 1. That is a prime number, that is a Fermat prime. And we like these Fermat primes, and in particular, we have standardized on this E value here that is hex 1001, right? So that's some power to the 2 plus 1. Uh, and we really like this. We just almost always use this as our E value. It works without this being our E value. We can use other values, but this is by far the standard. Now, we need one more thing that we need to do, and that is to compute D. So we're going to compute D by taking the... Uh, modular inverse of e mod phi of n, so mod that p minus 1, q minus 1. And it turns out this can also be efficiently done. We can efficiently find that using what's known as the extended Euclidean algorithm, and we can take and find this modular inverse. And what that means now, right, is that we have these values e and d that when multiplied together equal 1 within mod phi of n, right? This is kind of the definition of a modular inverse. We, we multiply these two values together, it's equal to 1. Okay, so now if we want to perform encryption with all of this data that we've arrived at, we get our ciphertext as being congruent with our message to the E mod N, where C is our ciphertext, M is our plain text, E is our public key exponent, and N is our key modulus. And all of this can be done efficiently using modular exponentiation. We can pretty efficiently uh, perform this operation. Now, if we want to decrypt this value, we're going to say that m is congruent with the ciphertext c to the d mod n. So m is our plain text, c is our ciphertext, 
D is the private key exponent, and N is the key modulus. So this, again, can efficiently be computed using modular exponentiation. Now, if we want to do some quick, interesting RSA math to uh, show another property of another cool thing that can be done using math, so as we're kind of discovering within cryptography, uh, cool mathematical tricks kind of form the basis and the foundation of a lot of these cryptographies, and we can kind of derive these cool cryptographic properties by extension of their mathematical properties. So we said that m is congruent with m to the e to the d mod n. Well, it's also true that m to the e to the d is congruent with m to the ed, which is congruent with m to the de, which is congruent with m to the d to the e, right? This is a relatively straightforward um, derivation of this uh, equation here, which in other words means that m to the d to the e is congruent with m. And all of this is to say, with all of this math that we've just kind of performed, is that we have this public key and this private key, and we can actually, in some sense, this isn't exactly the correct way of looking at it, but in some sense, we can decrypt a message before we encrypt it. Or in other words, the person holding the private key can raise some message to that private key, and now everyone in the public can raise it to the public key, the public exponent, and find that original value. So what this property is, that we call this, is RSA signing. We can sign a message. So we can say that S is congruent with M to the D mod N, where S is the signature, M is plain text, D is a private key exponent, N is the key modulus. And again, this can efficiently be computed using modular exponentiation. Um, so this is very cool because now we can also do signature verification. So everyone in the public can confirm that this signature was some message signed by the person holding the private key. They've kind of signed it. They've used their private key to sign some message and assert to the world, hey, I'm holding the private key. Look, I can prove to you I'm holding the private key. I can say for certain that I have signed this because I'm the only one that holds this private key. I can do this operation and prove to you that I have this private key and that I have signed it by raising some message to the private exponent. And now everyone can recover the original message by doing the, the signature to the E to recover the original message. And this proves to the outside world, proves to the other people that want to now raise to this public exponent, that yeah, it turns out that whoever signed this, they, they do hold the, the private key. They, this has successfully been done. So we have this M is congruent with S to the E mod N, where M is the plain text, S is the signature, E is the public key exponent, N is the key modulus, and again, this can all be efficiently computed using modular exponentiation.